So great, now we're going to talk about industry life cycle. And this is generally seen to be coming from uh, Arthur D. Little's product life cycle, uh, excuse me, product life cycle uh, model. That's a tongue twister, right? And so what you have to think about, and kind of holistically, is the drivers of industry evolution are changes in demand growth and what we call commoditization. Commoditization means that everything kind of starts to look the same over time. A commodity is something that is interchangeable. Think of like gallons of milk, bushels of grain, uh, ounces of gold, right? So over time, everything kind of starts to become commoditized um, or look the same. And this comes from the fact that um, knowledge is diffused across an industry. Those of you that are big into org theory may be familiar with the theory of isomorphism. And isomorphism is one explanation of commoditization of products and practices in a given industry. Correct. So, first, excuse me, first thing that we look at for an industry life cycle is on your y-axis you typically have demand. And that might be like the number of units per year sold or something like that, for example. Okay? And then as you come down, To your x-axis, you have time. And your life cycle will normally look something like this. It kind of starts at the bottom. Hopefully you can see me. It kind of comes up. It kind of grows and it kind of flattens off. And then it dips down maybe even more than that. Right? And so we have different terms for these stages. We talk about introduction. We talk about growth. We describe maturity. And then we talk about decline. Bam. Okay. So, a couple of important notes uh, to think about this on uh, here is that a product life cycle does not necessarily mean a firm's life cycle. Okay. We're talking about specific outputs of a uh, particular firm. So think of a big company like Procter & Gamble, right? They have health and beauty, they have grooming, they have kids cosmetics, adult cosmetics, uh, dental hygiene, all that kind of stuff. Every single one of those kind of sub industries that they have, like um, mouthwash versus um, women's cosmetics, would have their own um, product life cycle. Okay, because they would all kind of belong to different industries, right? Health and beauty participates in a very different industry than does um, you know, dental hygiene, right? So they'd be, have, they'd be having different products within the same firm competing in different industries. So you might have, for example, their dental hygiene is in a maturity phase, but their cosmetics uh, kind of is in the growth phase. It's all within Procter & Gamble in the same firm, but I guess the point that I'm making is Within the same firm, different strategic business units or different levels of analysis or analyses in the firm may have products competing in different industries and therefore have different um, industry and therefore also product life cycles. Now another thing that I want you to take away from this is the fact that product and process innovation have um, also kind of a relationship to each other, right? So when you're talking about the introduction phase, okay, you have a lot of product innovation. When you talk about the growth phase, you have a little less product innovation. When you get to the maturity phase, you have even less product innovation. And when you have the decline phase, you have very little product innovation. However, you can flip it and you can say in the introduction phase, there's very little process innovation. In the growth phase, there's a little, um, a little more product, uh, excuse me, process innovation. In the maturity phase, you have lots of 
process innovation. And then in the decline phase, you have even more uh, process innovation. Okay. Now there's a couple notes that I'd like uh, to take to, to give you on this one. Certain kinds of industries will not experience this full life cycle, especially technology intensive industries like pharmaceuticals, semiconductors, computers, they may always remain in the growth and introduction phase of the industries. And you think about why that is. Things like pharmaceuticals, well, because there's always that new drug coming out. Uh, computers, there's always that new computer platform coming out, right? So it's always kind of before it reaches the maturity point, that new product comes out and it kind of restarts it. Some industries, okay, especially those that um, are really heavy in commodities, think of food processing, construction, even apparel to some extent, may wind up getting to maturity but not decline. And you think about why that is. Well, because we always need food. We always need clothes. Buildings are always going to be built. So it's unlikely that they'll go into uh, decline. And of course, uh, some industries, I think video games, um, are also another good example because they are technological will wind up continuously having life cycle generation. I, mean, I think about when I was a kid, right? You had, you know, the, um, the Sega Master System, in, which went to introduction, growth, maturity, and decline. But as the Sega Master System was going into decline, they were already introducing the Sega Genesis, which went from introduction, growth, maturity, and as it entered decline, I think it was the Sega Saturn. And then, so every time one video game platform went into decline, they were already introducing other ones. So there's kind of this uh, refreshing uh, pattern that would go on. Now, the life cycle model is generally a good tool because it can help us uh, anticipate industry uh, evolution. But it's also very dangerous to generalize about any sort of a predetermined uh, pattern of industry development. Again, Arthur D. Little's product life cycle model did not necessarily anticipate the fact that certain high tech industries always stay in introduction and growth. It didn't, he does not necessarily talk as much about also some industries that remain perpetually in the maturity phase. Uh, but one thing that is generally assumed in this model, and you're free to disagree with it, is that in the long term things go towards a decline phase, therefore they go towards uh, commoditization. Again, I just mentioned some notable exceptions to that theory though, so you're free to disagree. So, a um, couple other things that I would like to talk about, maybe let me um, erase my board here, is you've got different industry structures based on this life cycle model. So, I'll erase this here. So, let's write them out. Introduction. Then you know, we talk about emerging industries, we typically talk about industries that are in the introduction and growth phases. Okay. So let's kind of characterize these industries, maybe uh, without a graphical representation, but let me just kind of talk you through it, right? So when you think about an industry that's in the introduction phase, you think about what kind of buyers buy them. Well, they're usually the rich people that want to have the coolest tech gadgets, or they're kind of like what we call avant-garde, you know, the hipsters who are trying to show off in some way, right? I mean, I think about like, um, oh, when I was in college, I had this friend who always had all the coolest gadgets. I mean, he even had something that were called mini discs. They didn't last very long. Um, it was a small disc, maybe the size of a quarter or a half dollar, that basically could store music. It was almost like a very primitive, um, it was somewhere between an MP3 player and a CD player. Right, because it was very, very small. So that was something that came out right away. He went to the store, he paid top dollar for it. He was showing off. Um, he had the money to blow, why not? Right? Now, the kind of technology that you find during the introduction phase is usually rapid technological uh, innovation. And you have to remember, when my friend bought his main disc, there were a lot of things going on in um, kind of music innovation, right? You had things like the iPod going on, um, you had these mini discs, you had all sorts of different music platforms going on and they were all kind of competing with each other. Okay? 
when you start talking, look, looking at the products that are available, there is a wide variety of products that are available and the designs are always changing. Again, think of big CD players, you know, things like iPods, the mini disc, we even had the Zoom that came out a little bit later, which was like an iPod, uh, but it used a Microsoft platform. So a wide variety of design features and differences. Okay. Now the manufacturing is typically what we call short run and skill intensive. So like my friend that had the mini disc player, that wasn't something that lasted very long. It, it kind of, it got beaten out by the iPod and some of the other MP3 platforms. And the manufacturing was skill intensive, right? It, as I mentioned, Process innovation doesn't necessarily occur in the introductory phase of an industry. So you've got actual people doing a lot of the actual manufacturing and the assembly, and that's another reason it's so expensive. Okay. The production of products in an introductory uh, stage of an industry life cycle typically occurs in developed or more advanced countries. The competition of course, will be heavily technology-based. Okay? So it'll be all about the bells and whistles and the product itself. And then the key success factors for firms in the introduction stage of its life cycle will be all about product innovation. How do we get the next big thing going? Okay? How do we shift from a big CD player to a mini disc versus an MP3 player? When you start talking about growth industries, okay, this means that products are becoming more and more accepted by mainstream societies. And in terms of the technology, you're starting to see not just product innovation, but you're also starting to see process innovation. So we're kind of, we start to, you know, we go from a wide variety of technological forms like hundreds to shifting to a very small number. And another example, maybe I'll use a, a one that's uh, a little different than uh, music, but video games. Uh, I find the history of video games to be absolutely fascinating. Um, even though I didn't play video games a lot, uh, per se, the history is amazing. Uh, and if you're ever curious, there's a great YouTube channel called Angry Video Game Nerd, where he reviews the, the, the huge variety of video game consoles that were available during the introduction phase, right? There were hundreds. And then you start to have the video game wars in the 1980s, uh, where certain dominant players started to come about. And this was more of the growth phase because people, first of all, started to accept that video games were kind of a mainstream thing, not just something for rich, cool kids. Okay, so they started, in terms of um, demand, they started penetrating you know, home use. Instead of hundreds of different types of console types, you start also seeing a reduced number of product types, and then there's also process innovation. So you start to see really... Um, kind of mass-produced products uh, coming into the market. The products themselves also become more standardized. If you look at the history of video games, like even just something like the controllers, there was a tremendous amount of variety. It had everything from keyboards to joysticks, and it started moving to that model, which you know kind of looks something like this where you're using your thumb. So the product design features become more standardized. In terms of the manufacturing, again, as I mentioned, you start because of that process innovation, you start having mass production. You also start having capacity shortage. Uh, we can't necessarily fill all of the demand that's out there. As I mentioned again, with video game wars, you start having entry and exit of firms. Certain firms like Atari wind up losing out, and other firms like Sega and Nintendo start to become the more dominant players. And the key success factors in a growth uh, stage of an industry life cycle is process technology, of course. So you got to have uh, not just the product innovation anymore, but you've actually got to learn how to produce certain accepted products cheaper, especially with things like design for manufacturing. When you come to the maturity side, you start having mass market customers. Okay, It's totally accepted now. This is video games. It's here to stay. Now you've got to market it to everybody. Okay, Now, the innovation winds up becoming quite a bit reduced, right? I mean, I think of even something like Sega and Nintendo during the 1990s, right? I mean, you had Nintendo, the NES, and then the Super NES. I mean, it was basically the same thing, except it was a little bit better. But it wasn't fundamentally different, right? Sega CD versus Sega Saturn. I mean, they both had CD platforms, better graphics and stuff, but it wasn't like leaps and bounds better. Okay, So the innovation winds up becoming a little more incremental. The products themselves become commoditized. 
I mean, you look at a Nintendo controller or a Sega controller, and yeah, it was pretty much about the same, right? They had the same, they had X-Men games. I mean, like in the 90s, you had Street Fighter uh, on Sega Genesis. You had Street Fighter on Super Nintendo 2. Um, so the products themselves also kind of start to look the same. They become a little more commoditized. The manufacturing becomes ever more de-skilled. Again, because you can count on the fact that in the maturity phase, these products are here to stay, you can start having more automation in factories. And because of that, you're able to shift production to less developed countries. The competition, of course, you have more shakeout and consolidation. During the 1990s with video games, it was really Sega and Nintendo, and even companies like Atari tried to make a comeback, uh, but they were unable to do so. So the competition winds up kind of becoming consolidated. Key success factors, again, it becomes cost efficiency, you want higher quality, and you start focusing on segmentation. As video games evolved, you start seeing um, kind of Nintendo and Sega appealing to very different kinds of buyers. Do you want the graphic speed um, and, and that kind of the hardcore action games that Sega had to offer, or do you want the more kind of kid, more kid-friendly uh, role-playing type games that Nintendo offered? So they actually started to appeal to different consumers. Even. And then when you come into the decline, declining industries, that's when you know everybody pretty much understands the products. Um, you know, there's not too much surprise there. You, the technology is all about the same. Okay, you got the same consultants spreading those best practices between one firm and the other. So the technology is all about the same. The commoditization improves or continues in terms of the products that are available. Manufacturing is plagued by overcapacity. There's more produced than what people can buy. You start having even more fierce price wars and certain firms exiting terms of competition. And the key success factors focus on even more um, process innovation, finding ways to reduce overhead, rationalization, low-cost sourcing. Think of things like Lean Six Sigma. Great. So we've kind of given a little bit more depth uh, just now on some of the factors of an industry life cycle. Next we're going to look at the BCG Strategic Environments Matrix. Looking forward to seeing you then.